This morning, I'm speaking on the subject of prayer, and oftentimes I find myself praying the words of that song to the Lord in my daily devotional time. If you have a copy of God's Word with you, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to find your place in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, this morning we're looking at verses 20 through 26, and I'm speaking on the subject of powerful praying powerful praying. We're in Mark's gospel and I'm in a series of messages here over three weeks entitled Real Religion. Real Religion. The events of Mark chapter 11 took place during Jesus' final week of life on planet earth. We often call this week the Holy Week. We've seen Jesus already in Mark's gospel engage an event referred to as the triumphal entry. He entered Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and he was met by songs of acclamation as the people welcomed him singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was welcomed as David's descendant, as the Messiah, the deliverer who had been prophesied of in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now after that, we see Jesus engaging in different important activities to teach people concerning his nature and his ministry. Throughout his final week on earth, Jesus and his disciples stayed at Bethany, about two miles away from Jerusalem. And we learn from the Gospels that each day, Jesus and disciples would travel back into Jerusalem from Bethany, two miles away. When the day activities concluded, they would go back to Bethany next morning, travel back into town. We saw back in Mark chapter 11, verse number 12 last week, that on Monday morning, the Monday after the triumphal entry, Jesus and his disciples were traveling back into Jerusalem, and Jesus saw a fig tree that had no figs, and he cursed it. It had the appearance of life because it had leaves on its branches, yet it did not have figs. So our Lord it used that tree as an object lesson. He, he cursed it to depict his judgment upon first century Israel. You see, the people of God, the Jewish people, in the time of Jesus had an outward show of religion, but they did not have the real thing. The very Son of God was right in front of him, yet as we will see later, they rejected him. And so Jesus used this fig tree with its beautiful leaves as a metaphor of people who on the outside seemed to have real religion. Yet the fig tree lacked the real thing, fruit, figs. And Jesus used that as an example for first century Israel. They had a glorious temple, a marvelous man-made system of religion and code of conduct. They had rules and laws and customs, yet they did not have real religion. As a result, they missed the very Son of God as he taught and performed miracles right in front of their eyes. Now, Jesus cursed that fig tree on Monday. Then he cleaned, cleaned out the temple of those buying and selling in an unjust way. And on Tuesday morning, he returned to Jerusalem. And verse 20 tells us, early in the morning as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Now, Jesus performed a miracle. He cursed the fig tree, this natural item created by God so that it literally died from the very roots. The picture is of this tree toppling it over, the root ball coming from the ground. Life has been removed from this plant. And in performing this miracle, Jesus proved that he is more than a teacher, more than a moral example, more than a religious leader. He proves through exercising power over creation that he is creator God. 
He is God. And he proved it through his power over creation. But he also, through his miracle, intended to teach an important lesson. He intended to demonstrate the way in which the Lord would move from working primarily amongst the Jewish people, Romans eleven twenty five, 25, to working amongst the Gentiles. He also performed this miracle to teach some important otherworldly supernatural truth about this thing we call prayer. And Jesus knew that his disciples needed not just the outward tapestry of religion, they needed real religion. And in order to have real religion, they needed to know how to really pray. Get the message of Jesus this morning. True disciples, pray. Real Christianity is marked by an ongoing habit of life type of prayer. God calls us to pray. We read in the beginning of time in Genesis chapter 5 this wonderful statement where the Bible says that a son was born to Seth and at that time men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And know this, as beings created in the image of God, we have this privilege of prayer. We have something that the animal kingdom does not have a right to. We have a soul that is made to relate to our creator, God. And the means through which we relate to him many times is primarily this thing called prayer, talking to God. If we want to tap into real religion, we've got to know how to pray. Let's see, sit at the feet of King Jesus this morning and learn what's involved in such prayer. How do we pray? How can we engage in the type of prayer that should mark the lives of real disciples? How can we move from empty religion to real religion and really pray? Consider from Jesus' teaching here five commitments we need for powerful pray. Uh, number one, I want you to see that in order to pray powerfully, we've got to first of all trust God. Everybody say that word trust. Uh, look at verse number 21. Peter they see the fig tree. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, linguists would tell us that in the original language of the text, Peter here uses strong language of a rebuke. Here we see Peter trying to correct our Lord. And isn't this often our disposition in life? We often find ourselves in a place of thinking we know what's right spiritually or thinking we know what the church needs or the world needs. And let's listen to Jesus and just hear what he has to say to us about prayer. Peter needed to listen. So Jesus begins to teach in verse 22. Jesus replied to them, listen, have faith in God. What a strange reply to Peter's rebuke. Jesus says, have faith in God. And we see this great word faith that we know is integral to our Christian experience. The faith is the very thing that brings salvation our way. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Know this, according to the Bible, good works do not save you. Religious performance does not secure deliverance from sin. Instead, it is faith, belief, trust, and reliance in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who lived the perfect life you could never live and then died as a substitute for your sin. Oh, hear me this morning, according to the word of God, there is no person righteous, no, not one. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Good works could never impress a holy, infinite, and eternal God. We have been separated from God because of our own imperfection, but God loved us so much that he sent his perfect son, Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, to live an impeccably righteous life on our behalf. 
And then he died as a substitute for our sins. And if a man, woman, boy, or girl will call out to God, trusting and believing that Jesus died for his or her sins, that individual will be washed and forgiven. The Holy Spirit of God will come to live within that person's heart. We know that faith is integral to the Christian experience because it is by faith that one is saved and rescued from hell and given abundant life here on earth and eternal life in heaven. But here, Jesus' teaching here, he calls for something more than that saving faith. He calls for that faith that not just saves, but that faith that strengthens. That faith that enables us to practically live the Christian life. Oh friend, get this great truth of the Bible. You are saved by faith, but in order to live the Christian life and have the joy of Jesus and his peace and direction in life, you need faith daily as well. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, the entirety of our Christian life is built upon trust, confidence, and reliance upon the person of Christ. To be devoid of faith in your daily life at work, at home, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your worship at church, to be devoid of faith is to be one who doesn't please God. For the Bible says, Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Now, such is especially true when it comes to this thing called prayer. Did you know that all true communion with God is grounded in faith? The very idea of closing your eyes and praying to a God unseen requires faith. The very act of carving out time in your daily schedule and saying, I'm going to cease from all activity and talk to God, that requires faith. I mean, there's days where my schedule is so full that it seems it would just be best to get on with business in my own strength, but to stop and just cry out, oh Lord, I need you. That requires faith, trust, reliance. 1 John 5, 14 through 15, we learn That confidence, confidence in God is a prerequisite to asking of God and praying to God. Understand why Jesus here mentions faith in relation to prayer. Our Lord knew well that one cannot pray well without trusting God well. And our Lord knew that a lack of faith is always at the heart of a lack of prayer. See, this morning we have to get honest with ourselves. If we don't pray, it's likely because we don't really trust God. The reason I am so slow to get alone with him and to ask for help in my parenting and in my life and in my work is because I really believe that I can do a better job on my own. Jesus teaches us that faith is tied to prayer. You can think of it like this morning. I've got my phone before me. By the way, I got the new iOS update this past week. Anybody else got that? You know when you're getting, you know you're getting older when your kids start telling you, Dad, there's a new download for your phone, the new operating system. Oh, I guess I better download it. But, you know, the new iPhone operating system, if you haven't seen it, it's got these large widgets you install on your home screen. So I went away. I went ahead and got the weather widget there for my home screen. I can see right now it's 78, degree in Carter, 78 degrees in Cartersville. When I, was, when I did this same thing in the last service, it was 71 degrees then. So it's getting warmer. But that app reveals the temperature in town. Think of prayer like this. It is like a thermometer that reveals how much you really trust God. Prayer is like a thermometer 
that reveals how much you trust God. I came to that realization years ago and it brought such conviction in my life. If I want to grow in my prayer life, I've got to grow in my faith. How do we grow in our faith? Think about that father, Mark 9, 24, who wanted the Lord to heal his child. And the Lord asked, do you believe? And he prayed and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Oh, this morning, if we want to be people of prayer, if we want to see Jesus bless our marriages, our families, our homes, our church, our schools, our community, we need prayer. But before we need prayer, we need faith. So let's go to the Lord and say, Lord, grow our faith so that we'll become people of prayer. And then know this as well. As well Romans 10, 17 teaches us that this book called the Bible will grow your faith. This morning, I had a lot on my mind for this Sunday morning, but I got up a little bit early and got out my Bible after I got my breakfast ready, and I read in God's Word and my daily allotment of Bible reading why. I've read this book many times before. Why? I need God's Word working in my mind and working in my heart to build faith. Know this, as you read stories about saints of old, as you Learn who God is and who you are through the Word of God. Something supernatural happens in your soul. The two-edged sword of the Word of God works in ways you do not see to build faith. When your faith gets stronger, you'll pray more. Strengthening your faith is a guaranteed means of strengthening your prayer life. So learn to trust God. Number two this morning, if you're still listening, say amen. Amen. If you've given up on me, say oh me. Okay, good, we'll move on. All right, number two, this morning we see not only do we need to trust God, we need to secondly expect God to work. Look at what Jesus says in verse 23. He says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Now historians tell us Jesus here was on the road from Bethany to Jerusalem. On the road, they see the fig tree that he had cursed the day before. It's dried up, withered, root ball coming up out of the ground. Disciples ask a question. Jesus says, have faith in God. Now he's going to teach them on prayer. Many believe that he points here to a mountain off in the distance, the Mount of Olives that would have been visible from this location. And he says, I tell you, if you have faith in God and you pray and you ask for anything, it will be as if you've got the power to say to that mountain over there, the Mount of Olives, be thrown into the sea and it be thrown into the sea. Mount of Olives had Mount of Olives had end time significance in the eyes of the disciples. So that whole idea is in play here as well. But notice that Jesus uses a metaphor. Many believe that this was a common provincial way of speaking in ancient Jerusalem. If one wanted, wanted to speak about doing something real hard, a monumental task, he or she might say, man, it'd be about as hard as throwing the Mount of Olives into the sea. You can't do it. And Jesus uses that common colloquial expression here to describe the power that will come our way when we learn to pray in faith. Get the word of God. When you pray, when you pray in faith, in alignment with God's word, you can expect God to work in your life. Jesus taught us this in John 14, 13 through 14. He said, disciples, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name that is in accordance with my will, I will do it. In John 15, 7, he said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that means if you walk in a relationship with me and you've got your tr- my truth and your heart and mind, whatever you ask, whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Oh, disciples, this morning, let's hear the words of Jesus and what he has to say to us. 
We have guarantee from the Lord. If we walk with him in faith and ask for things that are in alignment with the truth of this book called the Bible, the very moment that we ask, he moves to work to accomplish his will. Oh, don't give up in praying for that wayward child or grandchild. Know that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. So just keep on praying. Know this morning that you shouldn't give up in praying for victory over that old habit or that bad attitude or that secret sin. The Lord wants you to experience liberty and release. Keep on praying that he would produce his virtue in your heart. He wants to hear those types of prayer. Furthermore, when you pray for those things, You have this guarantee from his word. He will answer. I have a picture we're going to put on the screen this morning. I showed this during the last hour. We've got a minute work sign. Caution. Minute work. The other day I was uh, traveling to an appointment. Man, I was pushing a little bit close and thought, I think I can get there on time if I hurry and it's going a little bit faster and I probably should have been going on the road and all of a sudden I saw one of these signs slowed me down and I hate it when that happens so I see the sign and pass by slowly and a few minutes later sure enough there's guys out there with their reflective jackets on working on the side of the road the sign did not lie it was true There were men at work. And Jesus here in the word of God tells me, he tells you, he tells us, when you pray in faith, in alignment with the word of God, you can take it to the bank, you can believe it, you can have confidence in your soul. I will work. So church, let that be fuel for your spiritual fire. Pray, pray, pray. Seek the Lord. Make prayer a priority in your life, knowing that when you pray, he will work. Number three this morning, I want you to see that in order to pray well and pray powerfully, we've got to deal with our double-mindedness. Deal with your double-mindedness. What do you mean by that, Patrick? Well, look at Jesus' words here. He says, if anyone, verse 23, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and listen, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Everybody say that word, doubt. It's a compound word in the original language. Your Bible was originally written. Your New Testament was originally written. In Greek, Koine Greek, the Greek of Alexander, and here, New Testament writer Mark uses a compound word that spoke of something being two-minded. The compound, it's a compound word that speaks of one having two thoughts. It's the idea of dual judgments, divided or distracted thinking. And what a great picture for doubt. Now, I don't know about you, but I've often struggled with this idea of doubt. I've been in my prayer time before, and I've thought about Jesus' words regarding faith and the need to not doubt in prayer, and maybe I'm praying for something, and then I start to think, do I really have faith? Maybe I'm doubting God. I don't know. Boy, this is hard. Okay, I'm going to try to have faith. Don't doubt, Patrick, don't doubt. Am I doubting? Ah! I drive myself crazy thinking about that. What's really involved in this doubt? We'll we'll get this. It's a picture of two competing ideas, two thoughts, two judgments, two minds. This is a great picture of the distracted thinking that destroys powerful prayers. You see, we become weak in prayer when we become double-minded, two-headed, We become weak in prayer when we try to have a part of our soul focused on the world and also focusing on the Lord. This is what sabotages and stifles prayers, dual thinking, worldly thinking while trying to think about the Lord as well. Oh, if we want powerful praying, 
We have got to have a singular focus on the Lord. Remember the words of Scripture, James 1, 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So when you go to pray, pray, you can't be thinking about the things of the world, setting your heart on what you want, being obsessed about what people think of you and your reputation. No, you've got to go empty and humble before the Lord And say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I'm here to pray for your kingdom to advance, not mine. I'm here to pray for your glory, not mine. I'm here to pray for the prosperity of your kingdom and your church, not my kingdom. If we want prayer to be effective and it's working, we've got to strive to have a heart that is fully set on the Lord. We've got to have priorities that are lined up with his. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do that, friend, and you'll have a state of the soul that will result in prayers that the Lord can bless. Divided loyalties will always destroy our prayer lives. We've got to have a singular focus. I remember working in the restaurant industry, and I worked at a seafood restaurant, for several years that was famous for a particular fried shrimp platter. Anybody feel like fried shrimp right about now? Well, you shouldn't have come to the 1115 service. Y'all could be eating right now. Well, you'll get to eat here in just a minute or 20 or 30 minutes, however long it takes. All right, just joking. We'll be out here in a minute. But anyways, so uh, what was different here is the, the fried shrimp platter was butterfly shrimp. Let's have a moment of silence for butterfly fried shrimp, all right? <laughs> now, the, these butterfly, butterfly fried shrimp, that's a mouthful, were different in that there was no breading between the shrimp. So you know how you do a butterfly shrimp. It's so big to fry it correctly and to get the right texture and to cook it throughout without it getting tough or being undercooked. You take the shrimp and you split it. Now, most restaurants, they put breading all over that and in between, and they fry it. So you get this big glob, you know, size of a fist, big old butterfly shrimp. Now, now here, they, they split the shrimp, but then they lightly coated each side. And then they, what they called, flash fried the shrimp real quick. Boy, they're so good. But the shrimp came out split like that, divided Uh, One evening, I had this table that was already being pretty difficult. Did you all know this? Don't do this when you go to lunch today. But some people intentionally go into a restaurant and complain, 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 hoping that they'll get something for free. Boy, how tacky. Do not be that person. So I had this table, and they'd already complained. Boy, it's cold in here. We sat down, and our table was dirty. There were no crackers in the cracker basket. The soup, the gumbo you brought was cold. Where's your manager? So I brought the uh, plate of shrimp out with those butterfly shrimp like that. Looked really good. Put it down on the table and the lady said, "Uh, uh-uh. I thought, what is it now? She said, there ain't no way I'm eating a two-headed shrimp. I said, ma'am, that's not a two-headed shrimp. That is a butterfly shrimp. Get you a little bit of culture. You need to learn what a butterfly shrimp is, all right? (laughs) Did you know in life sometimes if we're not careful, we can be two-headed? Jesus warns us, divided. And hear me this morning, let's be on guard in 21st century America. We have a lot of blessings and a lot of things to enjoy. We got to be careful. If we're not on guard, we can become so earthly minded that we're of little heavenly good. We've got to make sure we are doing like Paul in Philippians 3.14, saying this one thing I do, I press on towards the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And when we have that frame of mind, when we go into the prayer closet, we'll naturally pray as we ought, and the Lord will bless. Number four this morning, I want you to see, in order to have strong prayers, you've got to ask for what you need. Look at what Jesus says in verse 24. He says, therefore, I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, 
Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. This word ask, A-S-K, is such an important and critical word when it comes to prayer. While prayer may involve giving of praise, expressions of gratitude, supplication on behalf of others, and confession of sin, a gift from Jesus that prayer should involve asking. Did not Jesus say in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Oh, many Christians have weak prayer lives because they never discover this secret. They've never learned that they have not, James said, because they ask not. If you want to have powerful praying, make sure your prayer time involves what I would call the big ask. Many people pray. They talk to God. They say all types of theologically correct things about God. They talk to God about everything under the sun, the weather, their friends, and what's going on in life but they never get around to asking some things of God. Be set free this morning and realize Jesus wants you to make requests. If you're worried and worn out, take it to Jesus and say, oh Lord, help me. If you're overcome by fear and frustration, lay it out before the Lord and say, God, give some relief. If financial needs are piling up and you don't know what to do in life say oh Jesus show a way and make a way and know this morning that Jesus invites you to ask without asking you'll never experience power in prayer John R. Rice has written an entire book on this subject called prayer asking and receiving it really helped my prayer life at one point in my Christian experience He said, so it is that many people often pray. They pray and pray and pray, but they don't get anything. Why? Indeed, they do not expect to get anything. Though they call it praying, really it is not prayer that does not come from a definite petition asking something from God. That is what prayer is. Prayer is asking something definitely from God. Do you want to see a result from your prayer life? Don't just use the same old worn-out cliches you've heard people use for years. Go and ask the Lord from your position of need. And lastly, this morning, I want you to see that in order to have powerful praying, we've got to let go of grudges. Now, I could take this last point and preach an entire sermon. Indeed, one day perhaps I'll do a series on forgiveness. But I want you to hear verse 25, and we'll conclude. Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, that was the common disposition for prayer in Jesus' day. You see that mentioned in Matthew 6. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing." Now, we have to be careful here when it comes to Jesus' words. Some will think that Jesus here is giving a punitive measure, as if he's some grumpy old man up in the sky who says, while you're praying, hmm, I see your heart. You're mad at that person. I'm not going to listen to you. Some depict the Lord operating in that type of way as if he's this mean, grumpy, tit-for-tat type of God who's just looking to get even with someone. That's not the meaning of Jesus' word. Jesus is just as he, in Matthew 6, 14 through 15, taught us, remarking on the way in which unforgiveness in a person's soul will stifle and shut up the free flow of powerful intercessory prayer. Uh, Peter remarked on this same reality in 1 Peter 3, 7. See, we know this from experience. If we are holding something against someone, if we have a grudge, hurt, resentment in our heart that we do not let go of, when it comes to the time of worship or the time of prayer, it will be as if an earthen dam has been built up in our heart that keeps us from truly talking with God. We want to experience the life-changing power of prayer. We have got to deal with the grudges 
and complaints we hold in our hearts towards one another? Why is it that so many Christians, when you simply mention a name of a person, they seem to have a checklist of things that that person has done wrong, quirks, annoyances, ways in which that person has failed. Listen, Jesus wants us to tear such lists up and burn them. That is not the way of Christ. That is worldly, ungodly thinking. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 3, 7, true love, Christian love, believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. If you're holding a hit list, if you've got a grudge list, you're not going to be able to pray as you ought. Deal with it. Get over it. Take it to Jesus. You say, I can't. Well, guess what? Jesus is your empower. When he was on the cross, Luke 23, 34, he set an example for you. He prayed for the very people who nailed him to the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Jesus shows us that true prayer to the Father is often going to involve forgiveness. And then when Jesus taught us to pray, do you remember how he taught us to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. How often do you pray for those who have hurt you? Do you take your grudges to the Lord in prayer? Jesus in the model prayer gave you that instruction for a reason. He knows that bitterness will eat your spiritual lunch. He knows that a grudge will keep you from real powerful praying. So in giving that model prayer, he basically teaches you how to pray on a daily basis. You mean Jesus wants us to nearly daily pray about who we need to forgive, he does. Why? Because he knows it is critical. Grudge keeping will keep us from the free flow of the Holy Spirit, and it will shackle our prayers. If we want powerful praying, we've got to pray as Jesus has called us to pray. Lord, help me to forgive. I'm letting go, Lord. I'm believing you and your word. I'm dying to self, taking up my cross, I'm following you, and I'm releasing that person from the enmity in my heart, and I'm focusing on you and you alone. When we learn that secret of prayer, we'll be well on our way to powerful prayer. 